Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I brought back Ali Shapiro because in our previous episode, 482, we talked about some food triggers I had for emotional eating. I even talked about me feeling like I was part squirrel. And so in this episode, I'm going to get vulnerable about my inadequacy feelings that stem from childhood and how they are playing out in my overeating. Food noise is a hot topic these days, and Allie and I talked quite a bit after our last podcast about some of the things I struggle with, and so she gave me some orders to try some things out. In this episode, I'm going to give you the scoop on what happened, and so I'm going to tell a little bit of my story. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did to try to counter it and how things turned out especially with my first sailing class ever and how it went amazing based on a couple tips that Allie gave me. So we are going to talk about all of these triggers that Allie is helping folks identify in the Why Am I Eating This Now program that is coming here in September. In fact, Tuesday, September 10th, 2024, Allie is going to have a masterclass to talk all about what's going on in the Why Am I Eating This Now program. And really, in this episode, she goes through some of the techniques. Ali Shapiro, welcome back to the Health Fix podcast. Thank you so much for having me back, Janina. I just adore you. We've kind of developed a friendship in the the interim, and you're just... You're, you're the bee's knees, as they used to say back in the day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Now, we just have a good time chatting. Man, I'm definitely, we're going to have to do like a live one where we hang out together for everybody. And and today, we're going to be talking about some stuff that like happened to me since we talked last. So I'm just going to turn it over to you so, yeah. so you can ask the questions. <laughs> and then I'll I'll bring my things in because I have, I have a couple of funny things I thought about since we talked last. Wonderful. So for everyone listening, we chatted about two eating triggers, stress eating triggers, yep. right? Last yep. time, which was we talked about when you go to visit your dad, you tend to overeat. And then you are a self identified squirrel and you yep. tend to go in your nut stash. <laughs> yes. Before you before you go to work in the morning. And we talked about you worrying about the system, your like uh client system provider going down. Right, 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 right. Yes. And people being upset and your business systems being a reflection of you. So yeah. we talked about those being first with your dad was the, what, tr- what tail trigger do we identify between? Oh, uh, the not good enough. Can't do anything not good perfect kind of stuff, you know, love the yes. man to death, but I could never impress him with anything I've ever done. Yes. Okay. So, and again, for, for people listening, go back and listen to the first one. So you'll get a more, a more comprehensive list of of explanation of the four, like, why am I eating this now triggers, which are tired, anxious, inadequate, and loneliness. And for Janine, we identified inadequacy was the root of both her dad and the systems, right? A lot of women, uh, business owners, who I know a lot of, we take person, we make we take things personally that are business systems, right? Mm-hmm. Versus like, oh no, this is a business issue versus me, but we conflate the two and and, and make it a reflection of us. So we're going to see. So Janine, talk about what we talk. So what yeah. was your marching orders yes. when you were going to visit your dad for his birthday? Okay. Not marching orders, but we, what we worked on together, because I never tell people what to do. I just help them come to their own conclusion. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think the term marching orders is cool because like we know like, what our things are it's our choice to do it or not you know and and folks by the way it's episode 482 if you want to hear all of that background information that's the episode where we talked about my my squirrel issues and me being a little nutty um but i could take that so many places i feel like i need like a stand-up routine on that one but nevertheless yeah so my marching orders are really to like investigate like what is it about my dad like what is our relationship what is it that really like annoyed me or that got me to the point where i needed to eat incessantly to keep me from going wackadoodle. Well, you know, turns out it's the not good enough. I could never impress him enough. And like, 
I would, I make him food, right? Like my dad, he had a, a swallowing issue and a couple other health issues some years ago. That's why I moved home from Washington State. And so I was always making him food. And he always used to say like, oh, Joel, my husband, makes better food than you because he makes man food. I make healthy food. That's what happens, right? But in my head, I'm like, I suck at cooking. I suck at this. I didn't, you know, become, I don't know what he wanted me to become, but I didn't do that. <laughs> so I don't even know, like, if I would have become something amazing that he would have been cool with it anyway. Like, he would have been, like, impressed. Unless I became, like, the world's, like, most famous woman, woman race car driver because he was a race car driver. But like, I'm afraid of engines. So th there's a whole nother side of that. So anyway, that was what I realized. And then I started making a list about all the other people in my life that I eat a lot around. <laughs> well, and that's why I love this process that I take people through because right. one example unravels the other. But, but, but before we, before we get to that list, yes. what happened with your dad? Because part of yeah. what we talked about in that episode but for people listening is when we're when we're young we need people to love us and think the world of us so right. that they take care of us but as adults our task around safety and belonging becomes what's important to me right. and so right. we talked about your neg his negativity and you feeling almost like you had to fix it yeah and that made you feel further almost invisible or unseen around him so what happened and what changed? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we DM'd about it, but no yeah. one else has. Yeah, yeah. So like literally I was like, all right, like this is ridiculous. I'm not going to ruin my health because of my feelings around my dad's negativity. And I was just like, all right, well, I'm just going to play into it. I'll just be like, okay, cool. I'm sorry you're feeling that way. Here's your dinner. Um, I made it healthy for you. And if you don't like it, that's fine. You can, you know, eat one of your hungry mans or something. I don't know. Oh, good luck. I threw him out. Um. <laughs> Just kidding. You're starving. So eat it or don't. Remember when you did that to me as a kid? Now it's your turn. Um, you know, of course, I'm not being revengeful. I'm just joking. But like, truthfully, I, I literally did just like take it in my head. Like, well, who cares? I mean, I'm cooking healthy for myself. I like what I'm making. If he doesn't like it, well, he can choose not to eat it. That's on him, you know. And if he wants to put like more salt or butter or whatever, he wants to doctor it up, then so be it. It's not a reflection of me. So I don't have to eat double of it because well, I'm yeah. out. <laughs> well, and how did that, and so what was the result of that kind of mental process of this is his eating choices are not about me being not enough? Yeah. Yeah. It, the end result is like now I, I literally, I, last time I was there, well, for his birthday and then for even afterwards, I was there another time. Like I, I didn't even touch like all the snacks that I brought down for him, his healthy snacks. <laughs> I didn't even actually eat extra things. Like I just wasn't, it wasn't the same, like soothing for me. I, I'd already had it soothed. So yeah, to speak. Yeah. And I want to talk about, I love that you use the word soothing because a lot of times people think they need a bunch of food rules, right? Mm -hmm. Like don't bring the snacks, bring the snacks, make the healthy food. Don't. And it's like, no, 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 no. Cause not, this, this emotional eating piece of belonging has nothing to do with the food. Instead, you grew and matured into saying, what do I need? And mm -hmm. I want to eat healthy and I still want to eat with my dad, right? Like, so it's, it, and it's like him making a different food choice. It doesn't have to be a reflection of me, which then makes me want to isolate and retreat from our relationship, right? Yep. Which then further competes, keeps the story loop of, I can never do, do well enough by him instead of being able to actually think about what do I need and then getting nourished in that emotional way. And then the food stuff just takes care of itself. Like there was no white knuckling, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, kudos to you for trying it because that takes some bravery, right? Yeah. To like, be like, okay, maybe I am enough and maybe I'm gonna focus on myself rather than think I have to go in and fix and save him. And and at 88 years old, I believe you told me he was, convert him to the to the healthy person that I want him to be. Um, and what right. I think that would then mean about me that I finally was influential enough or whatever, right? right. So some of this stuff becomes about the other, about who we think it will make us feel like we are rather than no, he's, he's just going to eat the way he's going to eat. And you probably want to maintain that relationship and strengthen it rather than, you know, rather than feel more isolated or not, not inadequate in it. So 
Absolutely. You took the marching orders and now you're experiencing the freedom. So, all right. So then tell us the, the realization that you had about that <laughs> from there. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I like looked at it and went, oh, okay, who else do I eat a lot around or like what other situations? And like, of course, we had talked about when my schedule gets off because my booking schedule was having glitches and making double and triple schedules for me. Um, three people at the same time. Oh, what the heck? Um, well, can we can we yeah. can we slow that down though? Mm -hmm. Because rather than eating nuts and just hoping that the problem didn't happen, I said, "Can you talk to your assistant about it?" And what yeah. happened from there? Yeah, we we went back into the system to try to figure out like what in the world could possibly be the glitches, and we ended up having to shut down one like room, like it was showing like a, a, another room was open like in the back end, but it wasn't there so we just end up shutting that down and so far we haven't had any issues so yeah well and and how did that help with your eating when you when you finally got clear and fixed what you were like at least addressed for right now what you what you felt was an inadequacy trigger for you rather than realizing oh this is the systems issue this is mm -hmm. again not about me <laughs> right how has that has that shifted the food or is there something else that we have to look at there no, I mean, it definitely has calmed me down around like the workday and like realizing I'm like eating before the workday because, you know, I didn't because I'm stressed out. Right. And then going, oh, God, what's going to happen today? Kind of a thing. And and yeah, I I'm not doing that either. It's like, mm, whatever. OK, I know now I know problem handled. I don't need to shove it down. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to I want to emphasize that because with these triggers, if we don't get to the root of them, we eat and the problem grows and then so does our sense of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. And so then we make it about us. And over time, we get these identities of I'm a squirrel and I like nuts, not, oh, I turn to those because fat makes makes me feel satiated, makes me feel safe. But the, the chewing, you know, this chewing mm -hmm. releases serotonin, right? It's we're not looking at the physical and emotional, why does this make sense? And instead, now you've actually fixed the problem and you de we develop confidence. Confidence isn't something that, um, confidence is a skill set. People think you either have it or you don't, but it's a skill set of like, I took care of it. <laughs> and now it's like, oh, I'm eating less because I'm making my life better. Not because I'm more and more deprived with more and more rules. So I just want to emphasize that for people because mm -hmm. once you understand that your eating makes sense and it's about safety, it you start to realize like, oh, the path is more fulfillment, not more restriction and deprivation of, mm -hmm. of you can't have this, you can't have that. It's, oh, I got to get my needs met. So I just wanted to like x-ray that for people because a lot of times in emotional eating space, it's like, oh, feel your feelings for 90 seconds and they'll go away and then you won't eat. But the problem is, is when that inadequacy trigger is tied to a story of like, I'm not good enough. My systems reflect me on me instead of the business, right? A, those feelings don't go away. <laughs> and instead they build and build and build. Um, and they're less feelings and more, I always tell clients the difference between climate and weather. Like they create a, like weather is the acute stress of like, it might go down, right? The system might go down or mm -hmm. um, it's my dad's birthday and I have to go visit him. But that weather comes in from a bigger climate in your case of like, I'm not enough, right? And mm -hmm. that is just like omnipresent that you can't just wait 90 seconds and that goes away. So I just wanted to differentiate that because I know a lot of people who have food stuff think like I've tried everything, but they've right. tried everything related to the food instead of this food as belonging issue. So, Makes okay. So you, yeah. So you made a list of other people. Let's go. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, I, I had to, because I kind of was like, you know, there's certain situations and it's people in situations, right. And necessarily doesn't really reflect on the people. It's more the situation. And so, cause you know, I have dear friends that listen to this podcast and, and some people situations have me eating more like new situations. Like if I'm going to go, for example, I just came back from my friend's cabin. We went and, and spent the weekend and it was just her and her husband and her kids. And I was good, right? No new people. But when there's new people at that situation, I tend to eat more because I think it's like, I don't know what to say. And so if I have something in my mouth, 
I can't talk or say anything or say anything stupid, maybe. Mm, back to inadequacy. Not enough. Yeah. 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 I Well, and look at that self-awareness, right? So now it's like, I don't need some diet plan or some, or some new, like, rewire my brain. I mean, that can help, but right. th the awareness around it is, so why do you, I'm, I'm curious, why do you think that you have to be the one to like, do you, let me ask this. Is there an assumption that you have to carry the conversation? No, no, not at all. I think it's just me. I'm oddly enough, sometimes I'm socially awkward in certain situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to figure out why. I don't know. So I think it's just new people sometimes and and new environments. I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. I've thought about that a little bit more. And I was like, is it the type of people too? Um, are they are they going to be the people that are going to ask me, like, what do you do for a living kind of thing? You know, and then start asking more about what's going on with my my business and those things, you know? And then I'm like, oh, because the naturopath thing is always an interesting conversation. Mm. And it, it can sometimes be acupuncturist and naturopath can sometimes be an instant like conversation killer in situations where people are like, you do what? Oh, you're, is that even a doctor? <laughs> you know? And it's like, I'm fine with it now. I'm like totally have told people I'm a quack doctor and I do acupuncture, you know, just because it's funny. But also because it's me deflecting because sometimes in certain situations, you're just like. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and this makes sense because, you know, we have a whole social engagement nervous system that yeah. is unconsciously scanning, especially at the, in the beginning. Like, do I fit in or do I belong right. here? Right. Right. And I can either fit in by saying I'm a quack because I think that's what you're thinking, or I can just be like, please like me and I'm gonna say like what I think you wanna hear. So right. let me ask you this. Yeah. In these new situations, what do you think you need to feel like you don't have to deflect and that you can show up proud of, like for me, it's, it's so fascinating because I'm like, if I hear someone's a naturopath or an acupuncturist, I'm like, I just think they're brilliant and they think in systems like I think, and oh my God, this is amazing. Like I, I have such reverence for that, right? I mean, you were just on my podcast and I was like, I love naturopaths. You guys are renegades. Like that is such a value of mine. Um, but let me ask you, go back to you. Yeah. What do you think you would need? And this is where we experiment. In my program, Why Am I In This Now? We experiment because often we don't know what we need. Right. And we need to kind of like workshop it and try it until we don't turn to the food. And then we know problem solved. Like we know what we need. But it, and in the, in the second module of the program, I offer like a list of needs of what we often need with each trigger. But let me ask you, because we can get very specific with you because we have this example. If you're, and I can help you workshop it too, in those situations, what do you think you need to feel like you can show up not sarcastic, not um, not avoiding sharing that you're an, an acupuncturist and a naturopath, but like soften into, like, how would you want to show up? Let's ask that. Let me ask you that first. What's important to you in those situations of how you want to show up? I mean, honestly, it's it's about being unapologetic about what I do and who I am. You know, that's mm -hmm. ultimately what I want. And it's taken a little bit. I'll I'll be honest, there's been parts in in my career where let's be honest, there there's a us versus them when it comes to MDs and naturopaths, and it sucks. Like I want everyone to get along and like cuz we can help each other so much, but I've been treated like crap. I've been treated awful, told I'm not a real doctor, told to get a new job. I mean, just some docs are just rude. And it's like, hey, I'm human, just like you. And I've said that to some people on the phones on the phone before. And so anyway, I think it's still, you know, I, I'm getting better. My God, it's been 17 years. And really the worst of it was in the beginning. I'm hanging on to old shit. I really am. Because now, like most, most docs are like pretty like, okay, you know, I've heard of a naturopath by now at least, right? And so there's just that little bit of me because of being in the Midwest, a lot of folks still don't know what a naturopath is. Acupuncture still, it's coming around, um, mm -hmm. but they're still like, hmm, you know, what's that? And then, you know, the podcast, great. Everyone's like, oh, cool, you know, but <laughs> if I started with that, right, I, I'd be just fine. Um, 
But there is still that little part of me that's just like, why can you not just be like 100% like, that's me. Take it or leave it. And just would have a big old smile on my face, you know, back to back to our joke about um, healthy narcissism. <laughs> before we started this. Yeah. This. Yeah. Yeah. We we talked about healthy narcissism before uh, hitting record. And um, yeah, all joking aside, guys, I just I think that if we had a little dose of being self 100 percent self-confident, it would be amazing. There was there was some little peptide injection for that. <laughs> So let me ask you, when you say you want to be unapologetic, what does that mean? How do you define that? Like literally not being embarrassed for what I what I am, what career I went down versus, you know, the traditional pathways and, and that just being like, hey, that's me. OK, you know, so, just me being OK with me. OK, being OK with me. I love that you talk that out because a lot of times, and we get into this and why I'm writing this now is like, when we're trying to avoid a risk, it's like what we don't want, yeah. right? I, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be embarrassed, right? Is what you just said, correct? Right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I always use my example with clients, like I, for so long, didn't want to have cancer. And I'm so grateful that I didn't have cancer, but I had IBS, I had depression. <laughs> I had, I was binge eating, I was emotionally eating, right? It was like, Oh, I was just trying to be like at zero, right? Mm -hmm. And when I started asking, what would it be like to be well, right? And so right. what do I want to be for? And so what I'm hearing here is I just want to be me. Mm -hmm. And and when we have, the, and, and the other thing I want to point out is that so many times in the personal development space, we're like, it's all in your head, da, 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 da. Like, like, no, people aren't thinking that. It's like, no, it's in your body and it comes from real shit, right? Like you said, and it's old baggage, but our yeah. body holds on to that stuff. And it's all, it's primed, right? That feeling of having to deflect and I'm a quack. That's unconsciously coming from past hurts that, that yeah. aren't all in your head. Like they are very real. And I think this is where the, the real healing that we need to do, whether we have autoimmunity, depression, you know, whatever is like, oh, I'm relating to the most tender but powerful parts of myself like shit, mm. right? Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> like, deep stuff. Yeah, I don't want to be embarrassed. But what I heard you say is I want to be me. And oftentimes we think me is like, and this is what we were talking about before we recorded, like we have this idea that unapologetic is like, well, fuck off, right? Right, right. Oh, right. You know? <laughs> right, and right. like, actually what's present for you when you go to these new places? And initially there may be some angst because again, why you get nervous around new people is you don't have the data to know what are they gonna accept, what they what, what, what don't they accept? What do they think of naturopaths? What do they think of natural? You don't have that yet, right? So then we get a little of that uncertainty trigger coming in, right? Um, I don't know where I stand among these people. So what do you, so, rather than so i think what would be helpful is just like we said your marching orders with your dad were like thinking about what you wanted to get out of that time with him how you wanted to eat um same with your your um work system is do you have anywhere where you know you're going to be in the next couple of weeks somewhere where there will be new people um yeah tomorrow i'm taking my first sailing lesson <laughs> oh my god that's amazing oh i love yeah. that so what would look like showing up as me not, and, and the whole of you, not mm -hmm. just the naturopathic side of you, not just the acupuncturist, um, but the whole of you who you're going to be a beginner, right? Because mm -hmm. those of us who <laughs> yeah. have a lot of letters after our names do not like being beginners. <laughs> nope. No, nope. it brings up the inadequacy, right? Like I shouldn't have to try at this. So part of this is self-awareness. Like, oh, am I going to want to just talk and eat? to like shove down this, 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 this bodily reaction, right? But what would it look like just to show up and feel your way into the situation rather than having to have a plan of how you have to be or default to your old, old, I'm trying not to be embarrassed. <laughs> it would probably be really freeing because you're not analyzing, you know, all the way going into it. Because have you ever heard of the Clifton strengths? 
and like the strength yes. based stuff. Uh, it, one of my strengths is adaptability. I'm like, oh, go figure. Oh, go figure. Because I would just like morph into whatever, you know, is going on with the rest of the group and never say a word about, you know, anything individual. So no, just, you know, yeah, it would feel good to just not have that stress of anything. Just show up as Janine, not the letters behind my name. Yeah. And what would that look like? Like, what do you think you might do differently so we can get some concrete, like exp some things to experiment with? I don't know. I mean, I guess just being me, like you get on the podcast here. I mean, honestly, you, you, this is me. Like every, every single episode of every statement here is me. So probably showing up me, podcast me, um, which is me. That sounds funny, but yes. <laughs> No, I, I love that you say that because so many of my clients, when we're working on these triggers, I'm like, where do you feel you need to be on, right? That's how we know mm -hmm. we're in our triggers. I feel like I have mm -hmm. to be on instead of, so what would it, so maybe I love that you have this like podcast, Janine, like you <laughs> have what that feels like. I bet it's a feeling of not striving, a feeling of like, I can be present and just see what emerges rather mm -hmm. than. I got to talk about this. I got to do this. I got to, you know, and, and I love that you brought up the Clifton Strengths Finder because I think that stuff can be helpful. And I think sometimes what we think of as our strengths, right, all have a weakness side. Um, and I know that strengths, like yeah. strengths based stuff is really popular and all that stuff. And what I found with a lot of my clients is we want, we want to honor that, but we also want to transcend yeah. that you don't have to be adaptable. Like, I I feel like you've been really real in our interactions and I like love you, right? Like, and it's like, okay. And the, the thing that I wanted to say about like when we meet new people, like in new, when we're meeting new people around new people, which is your trigger, right? Often we think we need everyone to like us. Yeah. But what we find when it comes to belonging is like, oh, we just need to find our people. And if we have even one person right? That we can feel like, oh, this person gets me. I feel seen or I feel connected. That gives us enough belonging in situations that we can then be ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's like tomorrow as you show up at, with as like podcast Janine, like wouldn't let me experiment with like, I don't have, I don't have to like make everyone like me, but is there someone that maybe I like, you know, I, I start chatting with and that feels like a genuine connection because I can now find genuine connections because I'm not being on, right? Yeah. I'm being Janine rather than assume, oh, to feel safe and not eat or, you know, in this case, it would probably be eat afterwards or maybe on the boat. I need everyone <laughs> to like me. <laughs> Depending on how the weather is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But right. you need to feel seen, right? And that right. will start to, to totally shift that deeper story attached to the inadequacy trigger of like, I can never do enough, right? Versus, oh, I can just be. So what do you think are some things that you might do differently tomorrow? Just so you have some clear, yeah. I like people to have clear things to try. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, probably just go into it as me, you know, and and not be thinking of any preconceived notions, nothing. And and I mean, because I've never sailed before and there's so many words to remember and so many things. I mean, I think I probably see me sitting there like trying to soak it all in just in general. So um, it's probably going to be just fine. I, not even probably. It'll be just fine. So, yeah, I think I'll probably just go in as as me and curious, you know, super curious as to like, is this is this my future of being a pirate? Because I've always wanted to be a pirate. <laughs> Like, as much as I want to be a pro snowboarder when I was a kid, I also wanted to be a pirate. Not like a mean pirate, like just someone who was like a nomad on a on a boat. That's all did wanted. you just want to be able to go, or what did? Yeah, what I did wanted the patch. I wanted the patch. Truthfully, I wanted the patch. And I wanted, yeah. I wanted to walk the plank, but not in a bad, like, like I'm pushing someone. I like literally want to jump off it. Like, dude, Goonies. You have yeah. to see oh it, God, right? I, I wanted to find the pirate ship. I wanted one eye Willie to hang out with me. And I wanted to like find all the little jumps. Like, and so yeah, like as a kid, it was like Goonies and pro snowboarding. Like, what else? Oh what else is left? So anyway, <laughs> it's been all these years, right? Since Goonies. And I'm finally, finally getting myself some lessons on a sailboat because I I'm I'm getting that catamaran in the Cayman Islands somewhere. Telling. I love it. Well, they say midlife is a second adolescence. So 
this this is the be hey everybody who's listening this is the beginning of janine's um <laughs> midlife crisis it's happening <laughs> happening full of fact goonies is coming back I I freaking love Goonies and I had a lazy eye as a kid so I had an eye patch so I can tell you it's not as great as well maybe I'd have more confidence rocking it at 45 than I did at five but (laughs) but I want to circle back to one thing that you said especially because we've talked about strengths is if we go back to that I think people are going to say I'm a quack or you know I feel like I'm not good enough we actually block the thing that is our genuine values, which is our strength, which in your case is curiosity, right? Yeah. Because if you leave with, I'm a quack, like it kind Mm -hmm. of cuts Mm -hmm. off the ability to like, for you to be curious about the other person because you're like trying to see how they react to like that kind of statement to get data of like, who is this person, right? (laughs) Right, right, right. So that's the, the, I think part of the, one of the biggest travesties of, of not really addressing the roots of our emotional eating is we then cut off our values and the genuine strengths of who we are because we're trying to protect ourselves from whatever risk we're afraid of, like being embarrassed, um, not, you know, people not liking us or falling behind, whatever, whatever it is. So I hope you see that, that like you are, I mean, to be an acupuncturist and naturopathic physician, you have to be curious. Like you have to have been curious about, why the traditional system doesn't work, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. You have to be curious about the body. You have to be curious about like how the body works as a system. Like like that is your superpower and you're cutting yourself off with that sarcasm that is trying to protect you. So true, so true. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I realize that, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So go in as curious podcast Janine tomorrow and you're going to, you're, and then you're, I'm going to DM you and find out what happened. (laughs) Do it. Do it. Yeah. There'll probably be an Instagram story at some point because it's like, it's, it's a big deal to me to be able to finally, finally do this after all the years of talking about it. So. I think that's amazing. And that's what builds confidence is like doing the things that we want to do, not getting everyone to like us and, and, and be able to, (laughs) <laughs> we know that in theory, but like, right. it's so stupid, right? <laughs> well, it is and it isn't. Again, developmentally, our, the first 20 years of our lives, other people liking us ensured our survival. So True. I just think of it as like an evolutionary like appendage we can leave behind in adulthood. And, and again, it also, I, I want to say, it doesn't mean we don't need people to like us. Like right. if you're in a professional setting or, you know, parent, like all of this stuff is primal. It just means especially in midlife, can we transcend and include it, right? So it's like, okay, I can be adaptable. And what else do I want to be here so my real strengths come out? And so it's like, yeah, it's great if people like us. And am I making sure that I'm nurturing the relationships with the right people? So, you know, yeah, it's it's the and. I, I always say to clients, like, ultimately, this work is holding the and and having the flexibility to know when do I maybe not lead with being a naturopath because this person isn't going to get it, you know, versus like, when is that actually blocking me from like really cool conversations? And over time we get better at having that discernment, but first we have to have this awareness that we just talked about to even know that like, Oh, I'm not really a squirrel who likes nuts. I'm someone who wants to feel safe when I'm stressed, which makes complete sense. And why that makes sense, everyone listen to the first episode. We went into that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, it's it's wild stuff. We we are interesting creatures. They're yeah. So oh. Interesting. About and we're so things. much more dynamic than we think we are. We we are often just entrenched in old patterns, and we think we know ourselves, but really a lot of those are just protective strategies to make sure that we got people around who who care about us because we need each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. So are we ready to talk about the why am I eating this now program a little bit? We yeah, can- yeah, I would love to. Thanks for okay. asking. <laughs> okay. Because like, you know, I, I pulled a quote from a movie because it just kept it kept going over and over in my head when when I was thinking about why am I eating this now or why, you know, why are there certain foods that we just keep coming back to? And, and so the Brokeback Mountain movie. It's a little interesting of a movie, I um, but I never, saw it. never saw it. Oh, it's, no. it's, it's very interesting. Jake Gyllenhaal and um, wasn't it controversial for some reason? Two gay cowboys. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. I see why that was. Is Definitely. That's a- <laughs> Put on the fringe. I don't I don't know if I was so cool seeing Jake Gyllenhaal like that. But you know, whatever. Like it, it's cool. It's cool. And the other guy, oh my gosh, I cannot think of his name. Poor guy. He he he's dead now and I can't think of his name. But I'll think of it. Um mm-hmm. oh, but wow. yeah. And anyway, the quote was, I wish I knew how to quit you. And I was thinking of that in my head because, like, you know, things like chocolate, macadamia nuts, um, you know, those kind of things. I'm looking up Brokeback Mountain. It's going to kill me because it's not coming up. There's Heath Ledger. There we go. And Michelle Williams was in there too, but Heath, oh, Heath Ledger. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And so lots of two two guys, and they also had lives outside of, and one had a wife outside of the situation. Oh. So it's very controversial. But nevertheless, the yeah. I wish I knew how to quit you quote was a very popular quote. And yeah, I think about it sometimes when I think about certain foods that are hard to quit. And yeah. for me, it's it's the macadamias, the pistachios, and the and chocolate sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would um I mean, you have more of the nuance and context in Chinese medicine, but if you think about, let's go back to our first conversation in the first podcast, we talked about food as safety and being coupled with attachment from the time we're born. And whether you're formula fed or breastfed, right? What is the, 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 the constitution of breast milk? Fatty sweets, Mm -hmm. dairy and sweets. And in Chinese medicine, dairy and sugar are yin. Yeah. Yeah. Right? They're comfort. They're expansive. They are room for us to feel our feelings and be nurtured. And it doesn't feel our feelings and identify our needs. Right? Mm -hmm. And so milk chocolate, ice cream, (laughs) carbs, Mm -hmm. all of that stuff is giving us this expansive feeling for us to be comforted in, right? Comfort is expansive. It's like, you know, I have a four year, four year old, right? And when he, when he has a tantrum, I mean, and he doesn't have a lot of tantrums, but when he has like a lot of, um, I'll give you a perfect example. One time I was taking him to my parents and he loves my parents and he knows them, but we forgot his slippers and his mm-hmm. slippers at the time he had never been without them. He was like two and a half mm-hmm. and he, we got to, and it, it was a transition object, right? So these slippers helped him made feel safe from coming from our house to his grandma and pop pop's house. And they lived in the suburbs at the time, which was a 30 minute drive. I live in the city of Pittsburgh and he was melting down and he was like, I need my slippers, I need my slippers, I need my slippers. And I was like, he doesn't need his slippers. He needs to feel safe in this transition from, from home to, to, and this is the first time, right? Mm-hmm. So I am not going to go back down 30 minutes to get his slippers, but the need, right, is he needs to feel safe in this transition. And he was two and a half, so his nervous system isn't fully developed. He's learning how to relate to his emotions based on my nervous system or the caretaker, right? So it was like, okay, Essa, Essa is my son's name. I know this is hard. You, You need your slippers, right? Witnessing that. He's like, I do. He's like, I need my slippers. I need my slippers. But he didn't really need his slippers. He needed to feel safe in the transition. And the way to do that was helping him feel that, but giving him a boundary of saying, Essa, I'm going to be here until you feel safe, but we're not getting your slippers, right? It wasn't giving him what he wanted, but he didn't really need the slippers. He needed to feel safe. And so what we do with food is we need that comfort of, I need to feel things. I need to, but I need to feel things to unearth the need right but what we do instead is i shouldn't be feeling this i should be over this i shouldn't i shouldn't be tired i shouldn't be you know all of that stuff and so food especially the dairy especially the milk chocolate right nuts themselves are very you know very fatty right this is symbolically and physically giving me the space right to like expand yeah. this but if we, and so that's why we can't quit those foods cuz it's it's stimulating attachment chemicals that give us the space, but it's not, it's not actually helping us unearth the need within that, which we identified in these three different examples of you. The need is, the need is not the, the need is not the food. 
it's the expansion and the guidance to unearth what the need is. And so, right. So eventually my son was like, he, he, he had his feelings. He, I made him feel safe by acknowledging his feelings and knowing as the parent, right. He, he can't know what he needs. He's two and a half at the time. Right. <laughs> so in why am I eating this now? That's basically the process is like identifying actually what your trigger is and then identifying what is the need and how can I create that safe container? The group becomes that safe container to get, to practice so that you're like, oh, this really works. Like, wait, I don't need a better food plan. I don't need to just tell myself that none of this is true, what I'm feeling, because it's all true. But it's giving ourselves the space, learning how to do that, to unearth the need. And the reason that we focus on the need and not like a behavior is because it's the emotional needs that are driving the behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's not like, oh, take five deep breaths or, or don't have food in the house, have food in the house, eat before you go to the party. It's like none of that matters because the need is going to drive right? The need is not, do I eat before the party or not? The need is, I feel socially awkward. So how do I, how do I manage that? So does that, is that like kind of a clear, that's, that's what we do in why am I doing this now is we get under what get underneath the nuts. We get underneath right. the chocolate, underneath the ice cream, the cheese, the alcohol. Although a lot of my clients come to me once they've gotten sober because sugar has then become their thing. Yep. But some yep. of my clients are still drinking, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a wide mix. So I kind of answered your question, like two questions at once, which I hope if you have any questions on either of them, you can follow up. But does that, is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it makes sense. I mean, cause we, we have the things that we struggle with, right. Whether it's the sugar, the drinking, the whatever, you know, and, and if we just try to quit them, which many of us have done this over and over again. And like you said, don't bring them in the house. Don't buy them. You know, heaven forbid you go to a party and someone's like, I brought your pistachios because I know you love them. You know, you're like. Right. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. You know, and so like the feeling still follows you. And, and that's the thing, right? The food, you know, that's why people will drive to go get a chocolate bar or an ice cream or whatever, because the emotion, you know, doesn't go away with the food not being in the house, I mean, it, it makes it, sense. And then you add, the, yes, and then you add another layer of rebellion, like, because my, my master's degree is in how adults change, complex change, and adults hate being their autonomy taken away. Like, okay. people are like, I feel like I'm just rebelling. I'm like, we rebel against everything. Like, as adults, we have to come to these conclusions ourselves. Like, right. the minute, you know, you tell someone, like, even I'm trying to, like, um, have a better relationship with my with my phone right and and I, I was like i was all about the olympics they were like bringing out my inner like physical competitor and i just found myself like oh my god look at that routine or oh my god and i was like i need to i need to do this i need to have a different relationship with my phone and so i was like okay you're not you're not getting on your phone today well then what did i want to do get on my phone today <laughs> So I always tell people it's not the goal isn't I want to eat healthy. It's I want to want to eat healthy. <laughs> right. Right. And we do that by addressing the needs, because what happens is like with your dad, with your systems, when you go on the boat tomorrow, we start to remove this baggage that's weighing us down and we start to feel lighter and lighter. And the more that we do that, the more overeating feels like, ugh, I just don't want to feel like that. But right now, so many of us already feel bogged down that we don't have the contrast, right? It's like the way that I used to binge on sugar, it felt like nothing because I binged on sugar all the time. Now when I, because for the past, you know, 20, like 15 years, I've had a really healthy relationship with food. I can't eat the same intensity that I used to eat, right? Because it's like, oh my God, like one bit and I get chills from my blood sugar. Whereas before it was like, you know, this is a regular Tuesday. So it, the same thing happens with emotionally, like we start to feel lighter and more free. And then we start to feel emotionally like that's going to weigh me down or I don't want to eat that way because I'm going to feel bogged down. To, I, now I'm getting a little bit abstract, but does that make, I, I think you would understand as like a naturopath, like oh, when yeah. you clean up someone's system, they can't tolerate the same junk that they used to do. Oh yeah. And it tastes different too. 
Like my girlfriend yeah. and I were talking about, she's like, isn't it funny how you could down like a whole bunch of Cheez-Its, but when you really slow down and taste them, they taste like vomit. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, they taste like cardboard. Like they smell like cardboard to me. Like even the smell of a grocery store to me smells processed. So in my mind, like I, I, I have that sensory input and it's like my mind's just like, I don't know. I'm not going there. And and so, yeah, Cheez-Its or, or like I used to love goldfish crackers. That was like a big thing for me. <sighs> Twizzlers were another big thing. But now if I smell them, I'm like, they smell so chemical, you know? And so it's like my body's like, oh, why would you do that? And, 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 you know, so that's why I guess we went to singular items like nuts. <laughs> no yeah. <chemical. laughs> well, no, and I love that because that starts to happen emotionally. As you work mm -hmm. on your inadequacy trigger, you're going to be like, uh, I feel like I can just – feel that's like not where I go anymore. Like, I yeah. don't feel like I have to say I'm a quack. I don't feel like it just, no, I just want to show up as me. And it becomes more and more natural because then you start get reward. You get it. What ends up happening is, cause again, you said you have old baggage, but we all do based on what have we been called out for? What have we been rewarded for? Right. That's like the belonging system we're bringing our nervous system, emotionally, physically. Um, but then after you start doing this, for, you know, especially the first 12 weeks in the program, it's like, oh my God, this feel like I, I trust in what feels good now. Like right. I trust in rest. I trust in, um, in, in helping to get support when I feel inadequate because we tend to isolate. Right. So it's yeah. like, we start doing, we, I don't know. It just, it starts to feel more natural to make the healthy emotional choice and the physical choice. Cause also, like you said, it just tastes differently when we're emotionally eating, we're usually not addressing the underlying stress. So we're physically cortisol dominant, you know this, which means you need more intensity of salt and sweet to register in your system, right? right? And then we're emotionally eating on top of that. And so you get addicted to intensity, right? Like you, you do, it's like, oh my God, this tastes so good. And it takes more salt, more sugar to actually register in your system that you feel satisfied versus as you get out of the intensity in terms of inadequacy, like I either have, you know, F you confidence or I'm full of self. -doubt. It's like, what if I'm just Janine and show up as curious and, right. and, you know, it's like, oh, I'm just, I always say moderation is the new radical because a lot of clients, the other thing that they work on is being all or nothing, right? Because that's, that's the other thing that gets better on this is you don't want to be all or nothing. It feels too exhausting. Um, because you realize you don't have to be. So I've kind of gone off on a tangent, but um, bring me back. What do you want to say, Claire? <laughs> it, it all boils, I mean, it all boils down to your thought process, right? It all all boils down to what you're thinking and, and what you're feeling internally, right? Well, when it comes to food. Yes, but I would say that the thinking is generated by the need. So if I have a need to be belong, if I have my system has unconsciously and unconscious doesn't mean deep and deep and dark. It just means this is what I've been rewarded for in the past. This is what I've been docked for. So I have a need to feel we all have a need to belong. And I think, you know, I identify as a rebel, like a health rebel, but even rebels need to belong. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah. the need. OK, I need to feel safe here. How do I feel safe? Well, the thought process then becomes I'm. I'm picking up on this person and it's all a perception. We don't know if it's real. I right. got to say a quack or with this person, I'm just not going to say that. So the need actually generates the emotions and the thoughts. So I don't even look at like reframing thoughts or, I mean, we, we work on that in terms of like what you and I did, but the focus is more getting the need and then rethinking how you can get that need met. Mm. But the thoughts and the feelings are all generated by the need to belong and to feel safe because it's so primal. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's definitely one of those those big things for for a lot of people. I know I'm not alone. No, there's got to be other needs that people are looking to fulfill when it comes to the emotional eating aspect of things. What other things do you see commonly outside of my my issues? <laughs> if you will. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, and and again, in in module one and why I'm making this now, people will understand their main trigger, right? So for you, it's really inadequacy. I love that you see, like, oh my God, it's this again. Oh, 
this comes back to this again, right? Right, right. Um, another, a big trigger that I've been working on, um, and it showed up in my body, my body basically breaking down after get, giving birth, because I was in menopause myself. Um, I don't have food stuff anymore, but I was working on overworking um, because, you know, we're self-employed, like that's, and that's just all I've ever done. And, and um, so the tired trigger is a yeah. huge piece for people. Um, when, when it comes to food, people um, often say like, I deserve this, right? Because they can't think of any other way to take care of themselves because they're so tired. So that is a need for rest, right? Mm -hmm. And people, and when I was dealing with insomnia from perimenopause and my son also, you know, being a newborn who doesn't sleep, I thought, oh, the only way to get uh, rest is to get more sleep. And I didn't yet understand that insomnia was a perimenopause symptoms. So I was just like, and I had always been a great sleeper and I thought it was just him not sleeping. Like there was a lot of complexity going on there. Um, but basically you start to realize like, oh, there's different kinds of rest. And how do I give that to myself, right? So for example, um, it was during the pandemic when I had him and so nothing was open. And I realized that if I didn't start walking, you need, we need physical rest, right? And I would feel so stagnant from just like, you're sitting around feeding a baby, you know, like it's, it's like, and there was nothing to do. And it was like, oh my God, I was thinking because I hadn't slept that I was so tired, but I was actually stagnant from not moving. And so it was like, all right, walking, walking, you know, like if, if you have so many constraints, no gyms are open. You don't even have time to go to a gym, but I live in a great neighborhood. I live near a forest, right? It's like walk. And so that would give me, right, it wasn't running, it wasn't, I didn't yet understand the importance of strength training, like this was all pre, <laughs> this was four years ago, it was a different time, people, it was a different time. <laughs> um, so giving myself walking to not feel so stagnant was a way that I gave myself rest. So learning the different types of rest, we get into that in the program. Um, another big one, if we talk, if we go back to COVID, um, with the uh, anxious trigger is uncertainty, right? Yeah. So whereas inadequacy is like, I'm not enough. I don't have enough confidence. Uncertainty comes from the outside, right? Um, I talked about this on our, I believe our first yeah. episode where um, when I would go for my scans for cancer, I would binge on sugar because I was like mm -hmm. uncertain about the outcome. Like, are they going to find secondary cancers for my treatments? And often when we feel uncertainty, we think what we need is control, right? We tend to feel out of control, right? I think a lot of people felt out of control during COVID, right? Oh, yeah. Like what's happening? Um, am I gonna get sick? I'm seeing people around me die. Like, do masks help? Do they not? Like what, like it, it was just supply chain issues. Like I can't get the food that I need. You know what I mean? Like um, there was just a lot of uncertainty and we, think that what we need is control, right? But what we actually need is to feel resourced with, during uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So in my example, in our first interview, I talked about not just saying I'm fine, not thinking I should be over my scanxiety season because it had been 12 years you know, since I had had cancer. It was like, no, Hallie, you're struggling. You're afraid. You have, at, at that point, I had no emotional healing. Like, it was just like, oh, you're alive? Wonderful. And again, I'm so grateful to be alive, holding the hand. Mm -hmm. But it was like, no, when my parents call me to ask me how I'm doing, I need to say, I'm scared because I had this feeling that I, like I was a huge, this cancer was a huge burden, right? That I was a burden. Mm -hmm. um, it was asking people, my then boyfriend, now husband, my sister at the time who lived in Philadelphia with me, will you come to the appointments with me? Yeah. Can I, I'm just, I'm going to cry in front of you, even though I, I mean, I didn't say that, but it was just like allowing myself, right, right to right. feel those feelings that we talked about. And so it's learning how to resource yourself during that, right? So um, learning what that looks like. And in the program, I offer ideas of what that looks like. And then, so with inadequacy, we often need comfort, right? And not comfort of what happens with a lot of clients is people will be like, don't worry about your eating. You're amazing. We don't, we don't care what you weigh. And that is all true, right? right? But there's still there's still the pain of turning to the food, right? And so, or it's like, um, here's what worked for me. Right? It's like, again, right. that often makes people feel more panicked, 
right? And so it's like, oh, should I be doing a cleanse? Should I be doing that? Right? And so we need a specific type of comfort where we're allowed to, someone will help us ask the right questions, help us, you know, help us figure out what we actually need. And in why am I doing this now, the group is such a tool because I give guidelines of how to give that kind of comforting support. We don't give advice. We don't, you learn how to like ask people to guide them so that you can internalize how to do it for yourself. But you need it modeled first. And me and the small group coaches that people have access to in why am I doing this now, learn, you, you start to internalize it from being asked that. Okay. And then the loneliness trigger is one of the deepest seated needing needs we have and is a layer of belonging is significance to feel like our first of all our needs matter and that we matter right i would say with you and i both because we're outside the system it's like oh my god we often don't get the significant right like clients should be like you so many clients like you could be a doctor right and it's like i'm like well i don't want to be one (laughs) you know But I, but I also understand, and, and I don't know if it's changing, but like doctors have a certain prestige that me as a quote, integrative health coach, don't, I don't get that, right? Even though I went to an Ivy League school for my master's or whatever, like when I was starting out, people didn't even know what health coaches were, right? And, and it's right. like health coach doesn't have the same esteem. Now, I mean, it depends on what circles you're in, right? To me, naturopathics, m- not naturopathic doctors, and acupuncturists have just as much steam as doctors, maybe sometimes more so for me, right? But that's because I've been on a Depends. certain journey. Right. And what ends up happening is so around loneliness, though, that is, we can be around other people, but it's shame, right? We feel shame from having this food thing. We feel shame for other reasons. And we often think that weight loss or thinness is going to give us that significance. And we think like, well, once I'm thin, then I'm going to do the things that will make me feel confident to make me feel significant, right? <laughs> yep. But that puts the paradox is the more pressure you put on weight loss, the more you think, and research shows us, the more you think about food, the more effort you put into weight loss, the harder it becomes, right? And so with my clients, my goal is I want you to think about food less and get better results. So with, with the loneliness trigger, the need is around significance. And it's starting with recognizing that like your need to take care of yourself when you're with your dad matters. Yeah. Your need to show up and show, you know, to get your systems figured out, right? So it starts like that way. And then you start to get the confidence and then the shame starts to, starts to melt. But I will say again, because you did ask about the program, the group component is essential. It is medicine. When you are around other people who my clients are very high achieving, they are very hardworking and they've tried everything, <laughs> but they're still persistent because it's, it's really hard when you have to eat three times a day and you've got food noise all the time. Like it, it just sucks the life out of you. So they still want to work on this when you're around other people who want to solve this in a very healthy, constructive way, right? Not it, it the shame melts. And so that loneliness trigger, you start to feel significance in the group. You start to realize you're not alone. And I can talk to my, till I'm blue in the face about a lot of people struggle with this, but when you actually experience it and then you're learning from each other and you get that sort of community and that, that surrogate belonging, I mean, not surrogate, it's real belonging from the group. You're like, I can do this. I can start to share with people in my real life. So you start to feel that significance. So those are the needs. And then, so that's, that's module two, um, getting that nourishment menu of needs and getting those needs satisfied. So huge. So tell us about the, why am I eating this now program in terms of how they can find you, how they can hook up with you and we'll get them all set up to join in. Yeah. So if this is interesting to you and you want to pursue it, um, come to my free masterclass on Tuesday, September 10th where it's called untangle your food triggers and you'll get some clarity around what trigger is it actually for you people find this masterclass so eye-opening and you can go to ali shapiro.com or ali shapiro.com backslash why am i this now live group and sign up for that um, i really recommend coming live because you'll get a sense of the community that joins the type of women that come to this program um, but if you can't make it live there will be a replay um, and registration for the program opens on September 9th. The masterclass is September 10th. And 
it's a 12 week program where we the group component is part of the safety and belonging um, that I'm talking about. So you will have that for 12 weeks. It's um, five modules. And this isn't just like I'm learning and learning. This is you're gonna actually implement and get practice within our group, practice with me. Um, and so the first module is identifying your triggers. The second module is identifying the job that you've given food to do <laughs> that, it, that you need to retire the job from. The third is making connections that have really been elusive for years. The fourth module is why do I struggle to get my needs met? <laughs> um, and then module five is really integrating all we've learned and experimenting um, over the holidays to interrupt some of the, the the eating patterns that we can fall back into. So it's a phenomenal program. Um, and for your listeners, if they enter coupon code Janine, they can save $100 on the program. So um, awesome. yeah, so that's I think that's, that's everything. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ali. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing about your Why Am I Eating Now program. I'm so excited to share about it. Yeah. Well, and thank you for for letting people um, be open up your kimono and uh, seeing <laughs> <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, Please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.